Chapter Fourteen of the Giant's Robe by F. Anstey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fourteen. In the Spring. Mark lost no time in obeying Dolly's summons, and it was with an exhilaration a little tempered by a nervousness to which he was not usually subject that he leaped into the dipping and lurching hansom that was to carry him to Kensington Park Gardens. As Mark drove through the park across the serpentine, and saw the black branches of the trees looking as if they had all been sprinkled with a feathery green powder, and noticed the new delicacy in the bright-hued grass, he hailed these signs as fresh confirmation of the approach of summer, a summer that might prove a golden one for him. But as he drew nearer Notting Hill, his spirit sank again what if this opportunity were to collapse as hopelessly as the first mabel would of course have forgotten him would she let him drop indifferently as before he felt far from hopeful as he rang the bell he asked for miss dorothy langton giving his name as mr ernstone and was shown into a little room filled with the pretty contrivances which the modern young lady collects around her he found dolly there alone in a very stately and self-possessed mood you can bring up tea here champion she said and some tea cake you like tea cake of course she said to mark with something of afterthought mother and mabel are out calling or something she added so we shall be quite alone and now sit down there in that chair and tell me everything you know about fairies mark's heart sank this was not at all what he had hoped for but dolly had thrown herself back in her own chair with such evident expectation and a persuasion that she had got hold of an authority on fairy law that he did not dare to expostulate although in truth his acquaintance with the subject was decidedly limited you can begin now said dolly calmly as mark stared blankly into his hat well he said what do you want to know about them all about them said dolly with the air of a little person accustomed to instant obedience mark's letter had not quite dispelled her doubts and she wanted to be quite certain that such cases as that of the sugar prince were by no means common well said mark again clearing his throat they dance round in rings you know and live inside flowers and play tricks with people that is he added with a sort of idea that he must not encourage superstition they did once of course there are no such things now then how was it that that little girl you knew who was not me ate one up he was the last one said mark but how did he get turned into sugar had he done anything wrong that's how it was what was it he hadn't told a story had he it's exactly what he had done said mark accepting this solution gratefully an awful story what was the story dolly demanded at this and mark floundered on beginning to consider dolly for all her pretty looks and ways a decided little nuisance he he said the queen of the fairies squinted he stammered in his extremity then it was she who turned him into sugar of course it was said mark but you said he was the last fairy left persisted the terrible dolly did i said mark miserably i mean the last but one she was the other then who was there to tell the story too dolly cross-examined and mark quailed feeling that any more explanation would probably land him in worse difficulties i don't think you know very much about it after all she said with severity i suppose you put all you knew into that story but you're quite sure there was no fairy inside the figure i ate aren't you oh yes said mark i i happen to know that that's all right then said dolly with a little sigh of relief was that the only fairy story you know yes 
mark hastened to explain in deadly fear lest he might be called upon for another oh said dolly then we'd better have tea for the door had opened it's not champion after all she cried it's mabel i never heard you come back mabel and mark turned to realize his dearest hopes and find himself face to face once more with mabel she came in looking even lovelier he thought in her fresh spring toilette than in the winter furs she had worn when he had seen her last bent down to kiss dolly and then glanced at him with the light of recognition coming into her grey eyes this is mr ernstone mab said dolly the pink in mabel's cheeks deepened slightly the author of the book which had stirred her so unusually was the young man who had not thought it worth his while to see any more of them probably had he known who had written to him he would not have been there now and this gave a certain distance to her manner as she spoke we have met before mr ernstone she said giving him her ungloved hand very likely you have forgotten when and how but i am sure dolly had not had you dolly but dolly had having been too much engrossed with her dog on the day of the breakdown to notice appearances even of his preserver very particularly when did i see him before mabel she whispered oh dolly you ungrateful child don't you remember who brought frisk out of the train for you that day in the fog but dolly hung her head and drooped her long lashes twining her fingers with one of those sudden attacks of awkwardness that sometimes seize the most self-possessed children you never thanked him then you know continued mabel aren't you going to say a word to him now thank you very much for saving my dog murmured dolly very quickly and without looking at him when mabel seeing that she was not at her ease suggested that she should run and fetch frisk to return thanks in person which dolly accepted gladly as permission to escape mark had risen of course at mabel's entrance and was standing at one corner of the curtained mantelpiece mabel was at the other absently smoothing the fringe with delicate curves of her hand and with her eyes bent on the rug at her feet both were silent for a few moments mark had felt the coldness in her manner she remembers how shabbily she treated me he thought and she's too proud to show it you must forgive dolly said mabel at last thinking that if mark meant to be stiff and disagreeable there was no need at least for the interview to be made ridiculous children have short memories for faces only i hope not kindnesses but if you had cared to be thanked we should have seen you before rather cool that mark thought i am only surprised he said that you should remember it you gave me more thanks than i deserved at the time still as i had no opportunity of learning your name or where you lived if you recollect we parted very suddenly and you gave me no permission but i sent a line to you by the guard she said i gave you our address and asked you to call and see my mother and let dolly thank you properly she was not proud and ungracious after all then he felt a great joy at the thought and shame too for having so misjudged her if i had ever received it he said i hope you will believe that you would have seen me before this but i asked for news of you from that burly old impostor of a guard and he he gave me no intelligible message mark remembered suddenly the official's extempore effort and certainly nothing in writing mark's words were evidently sincere and as she heard them the coldness and constraint died out of mabel's face the slight misunderstanding between them was over after all you are here in spite of guards she said with a gay little laugh and now we have even more to be grateful to you for and then simply and frankly she told him of the pleasure illusion had given her while at her gracious words mark felt almost for the first time the full meanness of his fraud and wished as he had certainly never wished before that he had indeed written the book 
but this only made him shrink from the subject he acknowledged what she said in a few formal words and attempted to turn the conversation more abruptly than he had done for some time on such occasions mabel was of opinion and with perfect justice that even genius itself would scarcely be warranted in treating her approval in this summary fashion and felt slightly inclined to resent it even while excusing it to herself as the unintentional gaucherie of an over-modest man i ought to have remembered perhaps she said with a touch of pique in her voice that you must long ago have tired of hearing such things he had indeed but he saw that his brusqueness had annoyed her and hastened to explain you must not think that is so he said very earnestly only there is praise one cannot trust oneself to listen to long and it really makes you uncomfortable to be talked to about illusion said mabel i will be quite frank miss langton said mark and he really felt that he must for his own peace of mind convince her of this really it does because you see i feel all this time i hope that is that i can do much better work in the future and we have all been admiring in the wrong place i see said mabel with apparent innocence and a rather dangerous gleam in her eyes oh i know it sounds conceited said mark but the real truth is that when i hear such kind things said about a work which which gave me so little trouble to produce it makes me a little uncomfortable sometimes because you know how perversely things happen sometimes because i can't help a sort of fear that my next book to which i really am giving serious labour may be utterly unnoticed or or worse there was no possibility of mistaking this for mock modesty and though mabel thought such sensitiveness rather overstrained she liked him for it notwithstanding i think you need not fear that she said but you shall not be made uncomfortable any more and you are writing another book may i ask you about that or is that another indiscretion mark was only too delighted to be able to talk about a book which he really had written it was at least a change and he plunged into the subject with much zest it deals with things and men he concluded on rather a larger scale than illusion was done i have tried to keep it clear of all commonplace characters but then it will not be quite so lifelike will it suggested mabel and in illusion you made even commonplace characters interesting that is very well he said a little impatiently for a book which does not aim at the first rank it is easy enough to register exactly what happens around one anybody who keeps a diary can do that the highest fiction should idealize i am afraid i prefer the other fiction then said mabel i like to sympathize with the characters and you can't sympathize with an ideal hero or heroine i hope you'll let your heroine have one or two little weaknesses mr ernstone now you are laughing at me said mark more humbly i must leave you to judge between the two books and if i can only win your approval miss langton i shall prize it more than i dare to say if it is at all like illusion oh i forgot mabel broke off suddenly that is forbidden ground isn't it and now will you come into the drawing-room and be introduced to my mother we shall find some tea there mrs langton was a little sleepy after a long afternoon of card-leaving and call-paying but she was sufficiently awake to be gracious when she had quite understood who mark was so very kind of you to write to my little daughter about such nonsense she said of course i don't mean that the story itself was anything of the kind but little girls have such silly fancies at least mine seem to have you were just the same at dolly's age mabel now oh, i never recollect worrying myself about such ideas i'm sure i don't know how they get it but i hear it is such a wonderful book you have written mr ernstone i've not read it yet my wretched health you know but really when i think how clever you must be i feel quite afraid to talk to you i always consider it must require so much cleverness and perseverance you know to write any book oh mabel only think 
cried Dolly, now quite herself again, from one of the window seats. Frisk has won away again, and been out ever since yesterday morning. I forgot that just now. So Mr. Ernstone can't see him after all. And Mabel explained to her mother that they had recognised in the author of Illusion the unknown rescuer of Dolly's dog. "'You mustn't risk such a valuable life as yours is now, any more,' said Mrs. Langton, after purring out thanks which were hazily expressed, owing to an imperfect recollection of the circumstances. "'You must be more selfish after this, for other people's sakes.' "'I'm afraid such consideration would not be quite understood,' said Mark, laughing. "'Oh, you must expect to be misunderstood, else there would be no merit in it, would there?' said Mrs. Langton, not too lucidly. "'Dolly, my pet, there's something scratching outside the door. Run and see what it is.' Mark rose and opened the door, and presently a ridiculous little draggled object, as black as a cinder, its long hair caked and clotted with dried mud, shuffled into the room with the evident intention of sneaking into a warm corner without attracting public notice, an intention promptly foiled by the indignant Dolly. "'Oh, oh!' she cried. "'It's Frisk! Look at him, everybody! Do look at him!' The unhappy animal backed into the corner by the door with his eyes on Dolly's, and made a conscience-stricken attempt to sit up and wave one paw in deprecation, doubtless prepared with a plausible explanation of his singular appearance, which much resembled that of Mr. Dolls returning to Jenny Wren after a long course of three penneths. "'Aren't you ashamed of yourself?' demanded Dolly. "'Don't laugh, Mr. Ernstone, please. It encourages him so. Oh, I believe you're the very worst dog in Notting Hill.' The possessor of that bad eminence sat and shivered, as if engaged in a rough calculation of his chances of a whipping. But Dolly governed him on these occasions chiefly by the moral sanction, an immunity he owed to his condition. "'And this,' said Dolly scathingly, "'this is the dog you saved from the train, Mr. Ernstone. There's gratitude. The next time he shall be left to be killed, he's not worth saving.' Either the announcement or the suspense, according to one's estimate of his intellectual powers, may vary, made the culprit snuffle dolefully, and after Dolly had made a few further uncomplimentary observations on the general vileness of his conduct and the extreme uncleanliness of his person, which he heard abjectly, he was dismissed with his tail well under him, probably to meditate that if he did not wish to rejoin his race altogether, he really would have to pull up. Soon after this, sounds were heard in the hall, as of a hat being pitched into a corner, and a bag with some heavy objects in it slammed on a table to a whistling accompaniment. "'That's Colin,' said Dolly confidentially. "'Mother says he ought to be getting more repose of manner, but he hasn't begun yet.' And soon after, Colin himself made his appearance. "'Hello, Mabel. Hello, Mother.' "'Yes, I've washed my hands and I've brushed my hair. "'It's all right, really. "'Well, Dolly, what, Mr. Ashburn here?' "'He broke off, staring a little, "'as he went up to shake hands with Mark. "'I ought to have explained, perhaps,' said Mark. "'Ernstone is only the name I write under, "'and I had the pleasure of having your son "'in my form at St. Peter's for some time, hadn't I, Colin?' "'Yes, sir,' said Colin, shyly still rather overcome by so unexpected an apparition, and thinking this would be something to tell the fellows next day. Mabel laughed merrily. "'Mr. Ashburn, I wonder how many more people you will turn out to be,' she said. "'If you knew how afraid I was of you when I used to help Colin with his Latin exercises, and how angry when you found me out in any mistakes, I pictured you as a very awful personage indeed.' "'So I am,' said Mark officially i'm sure your brother will agree to that i don't think he will said mabel he was so sorry when they moved him out of your form that you can't have been so very bad i liked being in the middle third sir said colin regaining confidence 
it was much better fun than old i mean mr blatherwick's is i wish i was back again for some things he qualified conscientiously when the time came to take his leave mrs langton asked for his address with a view to an invitation at no distant time a young man already a sort of celebrity and quite presentable on other accounts would be useful at dances while he might serve to leaven some of her husband's slightly heavy professional dinners mabel gave him her hand at parting with an air of entire friendliness and good understanding which she did not usually display on so short a probation but she liked this mr ashburn already who on the last time she had met him had figured as a kind of hero who was the swell master for whom without having seen him she had caught something of colin's boyish admiration and who lastly had stirred and roused her imagination through the work of his own perhaps after all he was a little conceited but then it was not an offensive conceit but one born of confidence in himself which was fairly justified she had not liked his manner of disparaging his first work and she rather distrusted his idealizing theories still she knew that clever people often find it difficult to do justice to their ideas in words he might produce a work which would take rank with the very greatest and till then she could admire what he had already accomplished and besides he was good-looking very good-looking his dark eyes had expressed a very evident satisfaction at being there and talking to her which of course was in his favour his manner was bright and pleasant and so mabel found it agreeable to listen to her mother's praise of their departed visitor a very charming young man my dear you've only to look at him to see he's a true genius and so unaffected and pleasant with it all quite an acquisition really i found him mother interrupted dolly he wouldn't have come but for me but i'm rather disappointed in him myself he didn't seem to care to talk to me much and i don't believe he knows much about fairies don't be ungrateful dolly said mabel who saved frisk for you oh he did i know all that but not because he liked frisk or me either it was because i don't know why it was because because he is a good young man i suppose said mrs langton instructively no it wasn't that he doesn't look so very good not so good as poor vincent did more good than harold though but he doesn't care about dogs and he doesn't care about me and i don't care about him concluded dolly rather defiantly as for mark he left the house thoroughly and helplessly in love as he walked back to his rooms he found a dreamy pleasure in recalling the different stages of the interview mabel's slender figure as she stood opposite him by the mantelpiece her reserve at first and the manner in which it had thawed to a frank and gracious interest the suspicion of a critical but not unkindly mockery in her eyes and tone at times it all came back to him with a vividness that rendered him deaf and blind to his actual surroundings he saw again the group in the dim violet-scented drawing-room the handsome languid woman murmuring her pleasant commonplaces and the pretty child lecturing the prodigal dog and still felt the warm light touch of mabel's hand as it had laid in his for an instant at parting this time too the parting was not without hope he might look forward to seeing her again after this a summer of golden dreams and fancies had indeed begun for him that day and as he thought again that he owed these high privileges to illusion events seemed more than ever to be justifying an act which was fast becoming as remote and unreproachful as acts will when the dread of discovery that great awakener of conscience is sleeping too End of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of the giant's robe by f anstey this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifteen harold caffyn makes a discovery 
harold caffyn had not found much improvement in his professional prospects since we first made his acquaintance his disenchantment was in fact becoming complete he had taken to the stage at first in reliance on the extravagant eulogies of friends forgetting that the standard for amateurs in any form of art is not a high one and he was very soon brought to his proper level a good appearance and complete self-possession were about his sole qualifications unless we add the voice and manner of a man in good society which are not by any means the distinctive advantages that they were a few years ago the general verdict of his fellow professionals was clever enough but no actor and he was without the sympathy or imagination to identify himself completely with any character and feelings opposed to his own he had obtained one distinct success and one only at a matinee when a new comedy was presented in which a part of some consequence had been entrusted to him he was cast for a cool and cynical adventurer with a considerable dash of the villain in him and played it admirably winning very favourable notices from the press although the comedy itself resulted as is not infrequent with matinees in a dismal fiasco however the matinee proved for a time of immense service to him in the profession and even led to his being chosen by his manager to represent the hero of the next production at his own theatre a poetical drama which had excited great interest before its appearance and if caffyn could only have made his mark in it his position would have been assured from that moment but the part was one of rather strained sentiment and he could not rather than would not make it effective in spite of himself his manner suggested rather than concealed any extravagances in the dialogue and worse still gave the impression that he was himself contemptuously conscious of them the consequence being that he repelled the sympathies of his audience to a degree that very nearly proved fatal to the play after that unlucky first night the part was taken from him and his engagement which terminated shortly afterwards was not renewed caffyn was not the man to overcome his deficiencies by hard and patient toil he had counted upon an easy life with immediate triumphs and the reality baffled and disheartened him he might soon have slid into the lounging life of a man about town with a moderate income expensive tastes and no occupation and from that perhaps even to shady and questionable walks of life but he had an object still in keeping his head above the social waters and the object was mabel langton he had long felt that there was a secret antagonism on her side towards himself which at first he had found amusement in provoking to an occasional outburst but was soon piqued into trying to overcome and disarm and the unexpected difficulty of this had produced in him a state of mind as nearly approaching love as he was capable of he longed for the time when his wounded pride would be salved by the consciousness that he had at last obtained the mastery of this wayward nature when he would be able to pay off the long score of slights and disdains which he had come to exaggerate morbidly he was resolved to conquer her sooner or later in defiance of all obstacles and he had found new natures capable of resisting him long after he had set himself seriously to subdue them but mabel had been long in showing any sign of yielding for some time after the loss of the mangalore she had been depressed and silent to a degree which persuaded caffyn that his old jealousy of holroyd was well grounded and when she recovered her spirits somewhat while she was willing to listen or laugh or talk to him there was always the suggestion of an armistice in her manner and any attempt on his part to lead the conversation to something beyond mere badinage was sure to be adroitly parried or severely put down as her mood varied quite recently however there had been a slight change for the better she had seemed more pleased to see him and had shown more sympathy and interest in his doings this was since his one success at the matinee and he told himself triumphantly that she had at last recognized his power that the long siege was nearly over he would have been much less complacent had he known the truth which was this at the matinee 
Mabel had certainly been at first surprised, almost to admiration, by an unexpected display of force on Caffin's part. But as the piece went on, she could not resist an impression that this was not acting, but rather an unconscious revelation of his secret self. The footlight seemed to be bringing out the hidden character of the man as though it had been written on him in sympathetic ink. As she leaned back in the corner of the box he had sent them, she began to remember little traits of boyish malice and cruelty. Had they worked out of his nature, as such strains sometimes will, or was this stage adventurer, cold-blooded, unscrupulous, with a vein of diabolical humour in his malevolence, the real Harold Caffin? And then she had seen the injustice of this, and felt almost ashamed of her thoughts and with the wish to make some sort of reparation and perhaps the consciousness that she had not given him many opportunities of showing her his better side her manner towards him had softened appreciably caffyn only saw the effects and argued favourably from them now that fellow holroyd is happily out of the way he thought she doesn't care for anybody in particular i've only to wait there were considerations other than love or pride which made the marriage a desirable one to him mabel's father was a rich man and mabel herself was entitled independently to a considerable sum on coming of age he could hardly do better for himself than by making such a match even from the pecuniary point of view and so he looked about him anxiously for some opening more suitable to his talent than the stage door for he was quite aware that at present Mabel's father, whatever Mabel herself might think, would scarcely consider him a desirable parti. Caffin had been lucky enough to impress a business friend of his with a firm conviction of his talents for business and management, and this had led to a proposal that he should leave the stage and join him with a prospect of a partnership should the alliance prove a success. The business was a flourishing one, and the friend a young man who had but recently succeeded to the complete control of it, while Caffin had succeeded somehow in acquiring a tolerably complete control of him. So the prospect was really an attractive one, and he felt that now at last he might consider the worst obstacles to his success with Mabel were disposed of. He had plenty of leisure time on his hands at present, and thought he would call at Kensington Park Gardens one afternoon, and try the effect of telling Mabel of his prospects. She had been so cordial and sympathetic of late that it would be strange if she did not express some sort of pleasure, and it would be for him to decide then whether or not his time had come to speak of his hopes. Mrs. and Miss Langton were out, he was told at the door. Miss Dolly was in, added Champion, to whom Caffin was well known. Then I'll see Miss Dolly, said Caffin, thinking that he might be able to pass the time until Mabel's return in the morning-room is she all right he walked in alone to find dolly engaged in tearing off the postage stamp from a letter hello miss juggins what mischief are you up to now he began as he stood in the doorway it's not mischief at all said dolly hardly deigning to look up from her occupation what have you come in for harold for the pleasure of your conversation said caffyn you know you always enjoy a talk with me dolly dolly made a little mouth at this but what are you doing with those scissors and that envelope if i'm not indiscreet in asking dolly was in a subdued and repentant mood just then for she had been so unlucky as to offend colin the day before and he had not yet forgiven her it had happened this way it had been a half holiday and Colin had brought home an especial friend of his to spend the afternoon, to be shown his treasures, and, in particular, to give his opinion as an expert on the merits of Colin's collection of foreign postage stamps. Unhappily for Colin's purpose, however, Dolly had completely enslaved the friend from the outset. Charmed by his sudden interest in the most unboyish topics, she had carried him off to see her doll's house, and in spite of colin's grumbling dissuasion the base friend had gone meekly worse still he had remained up there listening to dolly's personal anecdotes and reminiscences and seeing frisk put through his performances until it was too late to do anything like justice to the samp album 
over which Colin had been sulkily fuming below, divided between hospitality and impatience. Dolly had been perfectly guiltless of the least touch of coquetry in thus monopolising the visitor, for she was not precocious in this respect, and was merely delighted to find a boy who, unlike Colin, would condescend to sympathise with her pursuits. But perhaps the boy himself, a susceptible youth, found Dolly's animated face and eager confidences more attractive than the rarest postal issues. When he had gone, Colin's pent-up indignation burst out on the unsuspecting Dolly. She had done it on purpose. She knew Dickinson Major came to see his stamps. What did he care about her rubbishy dolls? And there she had kept him up in the nursery for hours, wasting his time. It was too bad of her and so on, until she wept with grief and penitence. And now she was seizing the opportunity of purchasing his forgiveness by an act of atonement in kind, in securing what seemed to her to be probably a stamp of some unknown value, to a boy. But she did not tell all this to Caffin. "'Do you know about stamps? Is this a rare one?' she said, and brought the stamp she had removed to Caffin. The postmark had obliterated the name upon it. "'Let's look at the letter,' said Caffin, and Dolly put it in his hand. He took it to the window and gave a slight start. "'When did this come?' he said sharply. "'Just now,' said Dolly. "'A minute or two before you came. I heard the postman, and I ran out into the hall to see the letters drop in the box, and then I saw this one with the stamp, and the box wasn't locked, so I took it out and and tore the stamp off. Why do you look like that, Harold? It's only for Mabel, and she won't mind. Caffin was still at the window. He had just received a highly unpleasant shock, and was trying to get over it and adjust himself to the facts revealed by what he held in his hand. The letter was from India, bore a Colombo postmark, and was in Vincent Holroyd's hand, which Caffin happened to know. If further proof were required, he had it by pressing the thin paper of the envelope against the enclosure beneath, when several words became distinctly legible, besides those visible already through the gap left by the stamp. Thus he read, "'Shall not write again till you—' and lower down Holroyd's full signature. And the letter had that moment arrived. He saw no other possible conclusion than that by some extraordinary chance, Holroyd had escaped the fate which was supposed to have befallen him. He was alive, a more dangerous rival after this than ever. This letter might even contain a proposal. No use speaking to Mabel after she has once seen this. Confound the fellow! Why the deuce couldn't he stay in the sea? It's just my infernal luck! As he thought of the change this letter would work in his prospects, and his own complete powerlessness to prevent it, the gloom and perplexity on his face deepened. He had been congratulating himself on the removal of this particular man, as a providential arrangement made with some regard to his own convenience. And to see him resuscitated, at that time of all others, was hard indeed to bear. And yet, what could he do? As Caffin stood by the window with Holroyd's letter in his hand, he felt an insane temptation for a moment to destroy or retain it. Time was everything just then, and even without the fragment he had been able to read, he could, from his knowledge of the writer, conclude with tolerable certainty that he would not write again without having received an answer to his first letter. "'If I was only alone with it,' he thought impatiently. But he was a prudent young man, and perfectly aware of the consequences of purloining correspondence. And besides, there was Dolly to be reckoned with. She alone had seen the thing as yet. But then she had seen it, and was not more likely to hold her tongue about that than any other given subject. No, he could do nothing. He must let things take their own course, and be hanged to them. His gloomy face filled Dolly with a sudden fear. She forgot her dislike. She came timidly up to him and touched his arm. "'What's the matter, Harold?' she faltered, 
Mabel won't be angry. I, I haven't done anything wrong, have I, Harold? He came out of his reverie to see her upturned face raised to his, and started. His active brain had, in that instant, decided on a desperate expedient, suggested by the sight of the trouble in her eyes. "'By Jove, I'll try,' he thought. "'It's worth it. She's such a child. I may manage it yet.' "'Wrong,' he said impressively. "'It's worse than that. My poor Dolly.' "'Didn't you really know what you were doing?' "'No,' said Dolly. "'Harold, don't tease me. "'Don't tell me what isn't true. "'It, it frightens me so.' "'My dear child, what can I tell you? "'Surely you know that what you did was stealing?' "'Stealing?' echoed Dolly with great surprised eyes. "'Oh, no, Harold, not stealing.' "'Why, of course, I shall tell Mabel, and ask her for the stamp afterwards. "'Only, if I hadn't torn it off first, she might throw it away before I could ask, you know.' "'I'm afraid it was stealing all the same,' said Caffin, affecting a sorrowfully compassionate tone. "'Nothing can alter that now, Dolly.' "'Mabel won't be angry with me for that, I know,' said Dolly. "'She will see how it was, really.' "'If it was only Mabel,' said Caffin, "'we should have no reason to fear. "'But Mabel can't do anything for you, poor Dolly. "'It's the law that punishes these things. "'You know what law is? "'The police and judges.' "'The piteous change in the child's face, "'the dark eyes brimming with rising tears, "'and the little mouth drawn and trembling, "'might have touched some men. "'Indeed, even Caffin felt a languid compunction, for what he was doing but his only chance lay in working upon her fears he could not afford to be sentimental just then and so he went on carefully calculating each word oh i won't believe it cried dolly with a last despairing effort to resist the effect his grave pity was producing i can't harold you're trying to frighten me i'm not frightened a bit say you're only in fun that Caffin turned away in well-feigned distress. "'Do I look as if it was fun, Dolly?' he asked, with an effective quiver in his low voice. He had never acted so well as this before. "'Is that this morning's paper over there?' he asked, with a sudden recollection, as he saw the sheet on the little round wicker table. "'Fetch it, Dolly, will you?' "'I must manage the obstinate little witch somehow.' he thought impatiently, and turned to the police reports, where he remembered that morning to have read the case of an unhappy postman who had stolen stamps from the letters entrusted to him. He found it now and read it aloud to her. "'If you don't believe me,' he added, "'look for yourself. You can read. Do you see now? Those stamps were marked. Well, isn't this one marked?' "'Oh, it is!' cried Dolly. "'Marked all over. Yes, I do believe you now, Harold. But what shall I do? I know. I'll tell Papa. He won't let me go to prison.' "'Why, Papa's a lawyer. You know that,' said Caffin. "'He has to help the law, not hinder it. Whatever you do, I shouldn't advise you to tell him, or he would be obliged to do his duty. You don't want to be shut up for years all alone in a dark prison, do you, Dolly?' and yet if what you've done is once found out nothing can help you not your father not your mamma not mabel herself the law's too strong for them all this strange and horrible idea of an unknown power into whose clutches she had suddenly fallen and from which even love and home were unable to shield her drove the poor child almost frantic she clung to him convulsively with her face white as death, terrified beyond tears. "'Harold!' she cried, seizing his hand in both hers. "'You won't let them. I, I can't go to prison and leave them all. I don't like the dark. I couldn't stay in it till I was grown up and never see Mabel or Colin or anybody. Tell me what to do. Only tell me and I'll do it.' 
again some quite advanced scoundrels might have hesitated to cast so fearful a shadow over a child's bright life and the necessity annoyed caffyn to some extent but his game was nearly won there would not be much more of it i mustn't do anything for you he said if i did my duty i should have to give you up to no it's all right dolly i should never dream of doing that but i can do no more still if you choose you can help yourself and i promise to say nothing about it how do you mean said dolly if if i stuck it together and left it do you think that wouldn't be seen it would though no dolly if any one but you and i catches sight of that letter it will all be found out must be do you mean oh no harold i couldn't burn it there was a fire in the grate for the morning in spite of the season had been chilly don't suppose i advise you to burn it said caffyn it's a bad business from beginning to end it's wrong at least it isn't right to burn the letter only there's no other way if you want to keep out of prison and if you make up your mind to burn it dolly why you can rely on me to keep the secret i don't want to see a poor little girl shut up in prison if i can help it i can tell you but do as you like about it dolly i mustn't interfere dolly could bear it no more she snatched the flimsy foreign paper tore it across and flung it into the heart of the fire then as the flames began to play around the edges she repented and made a wild dart forward to recover the letter it's mabel's she cried i'm afraid to burn it i'm afraid but caffyn caught her and held her little trembling hands fast in his cool grip while the letter that holroyd had written in ceylon with such wild secret hopes flared away to a speckled grey rag and floated lightly up the chimney too late now dolly he said with a ring of triumph in his voice you would only have blistered those pretty little fingers of yours my child and now he said indicating the scrap of paper which bore the stamp if you take my advice you'll send that thing after the other for the sake of this paltry bit of coloured paper dolly had done it all and now that must go she had not even purchased colin's forgiveness by her wrong and this last drop in her cup was perhaps the bitterest she dropped the stamp guiltily between two red-hot coals watched that too as it burnt and then threw herself into an armchair and sobbed in passionate remorse oh why did i do it she wailed why did you make me do it harold come dolly i like that said caffyn who saw the necessity for having this understood at once i made you do nothing if you please it was all done before i came in i may think you were very sensible in getting rid of the letter in that way i do but you did it of your own accord remember that i was quite good half an hour ago moaned the child and now i'm a wicked girl a, a thief no one will speak to me any more they'll send me to prison now don't talk nonsense said caffyn a little alarmed not having expected a child to have such strong feelings about anything and for goodness sake don't cry like that there's nothing to cry about now you're perfectly safe as long as you hold your tongue you don't suppose i shall tell of you do you and it really was highly improbable there's nothing to show what you've done and and you didn't mean to do anything bad i know that of course you needn't make yourself wretched about it it's only the way the law looks at stealing stamps you know come i must be off now can't wait for mabel any longer but i must see a smile before i go just a little one juggins to thank me for helping you out of your scrape eh dolly's mouth relaxed in a very faint smile that's right now you're feeling jolly again cheer up you can trust me you know and he went out feeling tolerably secure of her silence it's rough on her poor little thing he soliloquized as he walked briskly away but she'll forget all about it soon enough children do and what the deuce could i do 
no i'm glad i looked in just then our resuscitated friend won't write again for a month or two and by that time it will be too late and if this business comes out which i don't imagine it ever will i've done nothing any one could lay hold of i was very careful about that i must have it out with mabel as soon as i can now there's nothing to be gained by waiting would dolly forget all about it she did not like harold caffyn but it never occurred to her to disbelieve the terrible things he had told her she was firmly convinced that she had done something which if known would cut her off completely from home and sympathy and love she who had hardly known more than a five minutes sorrow in her happy innocent little life believed herself a guilty thing with a secret henceforth in the shadows there would lurk something more dreadful than even the bogies with which some foolish nursemaids people shadows for their charges the gigantic hand of the law ready to drag her off at any moment from all she loved and there seemed no help for her anywhere for had not harold said that if her father or any one were to know they would be obliged to give her up to punishment perhaps if caffyn had been capable of fully realizing what a deadly poison he had been instilling into this poor child's mind he might have softened matters a little more provided his object could have been equally well attained thereby and that is all that can be said of him but as it was he only saw that he must make as deep an impression as he could for the moment and never doubted that she would forget his words as soon as he should himself but if there was some want of thought in the evil he had done the want of thought in this case arose from a constitutional want of heart End of chapter fifteen Chapter sixteen of the Giant's Robe by F. Anstey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter sixteen A Change of Front. Well, Jane, said Mr. Lightowler one evening, when he had invited himself to dine and sleep at the house in Malakoff Terrace, I suppose you haven't heard anything of that grand young gentleman of yours yet. The Ashburns, with the single exception of Trixie, had remained obstinately indifferent to the celebrity which mark had so suddenly obtained it did not occur to most of them indeed that distinction was possible in the course he had taken perhaps many of mahomet's relations thought it a pity that he should abandon his excellent prospects in the caravan business where he was making himself so much respected for the precarious and unremunerative career of a prophet Trixie, however, had followed the book's career with wondering delight. She had bought a copy for herself, Mark not having found himself equal to sending her one, and she had eagerly collected reviews and allusions of all kinds, and tried hard to induce Martha at least to read the book. Martha had coldly declined. She had something of her mother's hard, unimaginative nature, and read but little fiction and besides having from the first sided strongly against mark she would not compromise her dignity now by betraying so much interest in his performances cuthbert read the book but in secret and as he said nothing to its discredit it may be presumed that he could find no particular fault with it mrs ashburn would have felt almost inclined had she known the book was in the house to order it to be put away from among them like an evil thing so strong was her prejudice and her husband whatever he felt expressed no interest or curiosity on the subject so at mr lightowler's question which was put more as a vent for his own outraged feelings than any real desire for information mrs ashburn's face assumed its grimmest and coldest expression as she replied no solomon mark has chosen his own road we neither have nor expect to have any news of him at this very moment he may be bitterly repenting his folly and disobedience somewhere upon which cuthbert observed that he considered that extremely probable and mr ashburn found courage to ask a question uh, i suppose he hasn't come or written to you yet solomon he said no matthew said his brother-in-law he has not i'd just like to see him coming to me he wouldn't come twice i can tell him 
"'No, I tell you, as I told him, I've done with him. "'When a young man repays all I've spent on him "'with base ingratitude like that, I wash my hands of him. "'I say deliberately, I wash my hands. "'Why, he might have worked on at his law, "'and I'd have set him up and put him in the way "'of making his living in a few years. "'Made him a credit to all connected with him, I would. "'But he's chosen to turn a low scribbler and starve in a garret which you'll come to soon enough and that's what i get for trying to help a nephew well it will be a lesson to me i know that young men have gone off since my young days a lazy selfish conceited lot they are all of em not all solomon said his sister i'm sure there are young men still who cuthbert how long was it you stayed at the office after hours to make up your books of his own free will too solomon and he's never had any one to encourage him or help him on poor boy mrs ashburn was not without hopes that her brother might be brought to understand in time that the family did not end with mark but she might have spared her pains just then no oh, he said with a rather contemptuous toss of the head i wasn't hinting i've nothing particular against him he's steady enough i dare say one of the other kinds enough in a small family in all conscience ah jane if ever a man was regularly taken in by a boy i was by his brother mark a bright smart clever young chap he was as i'd wish to see give that feller an education and put him to a profession thinks i and he'll be a credit to you some of these days and see what's come of it it's very sad very sad for all of us i'm sure sighed mrs ashburn at this trixie who had been listening to all with hot cheeks and trembling lips could hold out no longer you talk of mark uncle and all of you she said looking prettier for her indignation as if he was a disgrace to us all you seem to think he's starving somewhere in a garret and unknown to everybody but he's nothing of the sort he's famous already whether you believe it or not you ought to be proud of him beatrix you forget yourself said her mother before your uncle too i can't help it said trixie there's no one to speak up for poor mark but me ma and i must and it's all quite true i hear all about books and things from at the art school where i go and mark's book is being talked about everywhere and you needn't be afraid of his coming to you for money uncle for i was told that mark will be able to get as much money as ever he likes for his next books he will be quite rich and all just by writing and nobody but you here seems to think the worse of him for what he has done i'll show you what the papers say about him presently why even your paper ma the weekly horrib has a long article praising mark's book this week so i should think it can't be so very wicked wait a minute and you shall see and trixie burst impetuously out of the room to fetch the book in which she had pasted the reviews leaving the others in a rather crestfallen condition uncle solomon especially looking straight in front of him with a fish-like stare being engaged in trying to assimilate the very novel ideas of a literary career which had just been put before him mrs ashburn muttered something about trixie being always headstrong and never given to serious things but even she was a little shaken by the unexpected testimony of her favourite oracle, the Horrib. "'Look here, uncle,' said Trixie, returning with the book, and laying it down open before him. "'See what the... blank says, and the... blank. Oh, and all of them!' "'I don't want to see em, he said, sulkily pushing the book from him. "'Take the things away, child. Who cares what they say? They're all at the same scribbling business themselves. Of course they crack up one another.' but he listened with a dull glazed look in his eyes and a grunt now and then while she read extracts aloud until by and by in spite of his efforts to repress it a kind of hard grin of satisfaction began to widen his mouth where's this precious book to be got he said at last are you so sure he's disgraced you now uncle demanded trixie triumphantly men's praise is of little value said mrs ashburn harshly your uncle and we look at what mark has done from the christian standpoint well look here you know suppose we go into the matter now let's talk it out a bit said uncle solomon coming out of a second brown study 
"'What have you got against Mark?' "'What have I got against him, Solomon?' echoed his sister in supreme amazement. "'Yes, what's he done to set you all shaking your heads at?' "'Why, surely there's no need to tell you. "'Well, first there's his ingratitude to you. "'After all, you've done for him.' "'Put me out of the question,' said Mr. Lightowler, with a magnanimous sweep of his hand. "'I can take care of myself, I should hope. "'What I want to get at is what he's done to you. "'What do you accuse the boy of doing, Matthew, eh?' Poor little Mr. Ashburn seemed completely overwhelmed by this sudden demand on him. "'I? Oh, I! "'Well, Jane has strong views, you know, Solomon, "'decided opinions on these subjects.' and and so have i he concluded feebly hm said mr lightowler half to himself shouldn't have thought that was what was the matter with you well jane then i come back to you what's he done come he hasn't robbed a church or forged a cheque has he if you wish me to tell you what you know perfectly well already he has, in defiance of what he knows I feel on this subject, connected himself with a thing I strongly disapprove of, a light-minded fiction. Now you know, Jane, that's all your confounded— I'm speaking to you as a brother, you know— your confounded, narrow-minded nonsense. Supposing he has written a light-minded fiction, as you call it, where's the harm of it? With the early training you received together with me, Solomon, I wonder you can ask— you know very well what would have been thought of reading to say nothing of writing a novel in our young days and it cuts me to the heart to think that a son of mine should place another stumbling block in the hands of youth stumbling grandmother cried mr lightowler in our young days as you say we didn't go to playhouses and only read good and improving books and a dull time we had of it i don't read novels myself now having other things to think about but the world's gone round since then jane even chapel folk read these light-minded fictions nowadays and don't seem to be stumbling around more than usual if they take no harm their own consciences must be their guide but i've a right to judge for myself as well as they i think solomon exactly but not for them too that's what you're doing jane who the dickens are you to go about groaning that mark's a prodigal son or a lost sheep or a goat or one of those uncomplimentary animals all because he's written a book that every one else is praising why are you to be right and all the rest of the world wrong i'd like to know here you've gone and hunted the lad out of the house without ever consulting me who i think jane i do think have acted so as to deserve to be considered and consulted in the matter and all for what i'm sure solomon said mrs ashburn with one or two hard sniffs which were her nearest approach to public emotion i'm sure i never expected this from you and you were quite as angry with mark as any of us because i didn't know all i was kept in the dark from what you said i didn't know but what he'd written some rubbish which wouldn't keep him in bread and cheese for a fortnight and leave him as unknown as it found him naturally i didn't care about that when i'd hoped he'd be a credit to me but it appears he is being a credit to me he's making his fortune getting famous setting the upper circles talking of him i thought sir andrew up at the manor house was a chafing on me the other day when he began complimenting me on my nephew and i answered him precious short but i begin to think now as he meant it and i went and made a fool of myself all i ever asked of mark was to be a credit to me and so long as he goes and is a credit to me what do i care how he does it not that at sentiments of such unhoped-for breadth trixie was so far carried away with delight and gratitude as to throw her arms round her uncle's puffy red neck and bestow two or three warm kisses upon him then you won't give him up after all will you uncle she cried you don't think him a disgrace to you uncle solomon looked round him with the sense that he was coming out uncommonly well there's no narrow-mindedness about me trixie my girl he said i never have said nor don't say now that i have given your brother mark up he chose not to take the advantages i offered him and i don't deny feeling put out by it but what's done can't be helped i shall have a look into this book of his 
and if I see nothing to disapprove of in it, why I shall let him know he can still look to his old uncle if he wants anything. I don't say more than that at present, but I do think, Jane, that you've been too hard on the boy. We can't all be such particular Baptists as you are, you know. I'm glad to hear you say that, Solomon, quavered Mr. Ashburn, because I said as much to Jane, if you recollect my mentioning it, my dear, at the time, but she has decided views, and she thought otherwise. The unfortunate Jane, seeing herself deserted on all sides, began to qualify, not sorry in her inmost heart to be able to think more leniently, since the weekly horror sanctioned it, of her son's act of independence. "'I may have acted on imperfect knowledge,' she said. "'I may have been too hasty in concluding that Mark had only written some worldly and frivolous love-tale to keep minds from dwelling on higher subjects. If so, I'm willing to own it, and if Mark wants to come to me—' that Mr. Lightowler did not care to lose his monopoly of magnanimity in this way. "'That comes too late now, Jane,' he said. "'He won't come back to you now, after the way you've treated him. You've taken your line, and you'll have to keep to it. But he shan't lose by that while I live, or afterwards, for that matter. He was always more of a son to me than ever you made of him.' And when he went to bed, after some elaboration of his views on the question, he left the family, with one exception, to the highly unsatisfactory reflection that they had cut themselves off from all right to feel proud and gratified at Mark's renown, and that the breach between them was too wide now to be bridged. End of chapter 16《Chapter 17 of The Giant's Robe by F. Anstey this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17 In which Mark makes an enemy and recovers a friend. Mark's fame was still increasing, and he began to have proofs of this in a pleasanter and more substantial form than empty compliment. He was constantly receiving letters from editors or publishers inviting him to write for them, and offering terms which exceeded his highest expectations. Several of these proposals, all the more tempting ones, in fact, he accepted at once, not that he had anything by him in manuscript just then, of the kind required from him, but he felt a vague sense of power to turn out something very fine indeed, long before the time appointed for the fulfilment of his promises. But so far he had not done any regular literary work since his defection. He was still at St. Peter's, which occupied most of his time, but somehow, now that he could devote his evenings without scruple to the delights of composition, those delights seemed to have lost their keenness, and besides, he had begun to go out a great deal. He had plenty of time before him, however, and his prospects were excellent. He was sure of considerable sums under his many agreements as soon as he had leisure to set to work. There could be no greater mistake than for a young writer to flood the market from his inkstand, a reflection which comforted Mark for a rather long and unexpected season of drought. Chilton and Fladgate had begun to sound him respecting a second book, but Mark could not yet decide whether to make his coup with One Fair Daughter or Sweet Bells Jangled. At first he had been feverishly anxious to get a book out, which should legitimately be his own as soon as possible, but now, when the time had come, he hung back. He did not exactly feel any misgivings as to their merits, but he could not help seeing that with every day it was becoming more and more difficult to put illusion completely in the shade, and that if he meant to effect this, he could afford to neglect no precautions. New and brilliant ideas, necessitating the entire reconstruction of the plots, were constantly occurring to him, and he set impulsively to work, shifting and interpolating, polishing and repolishing, until he must have invested his work with a dazzling glitter, and yet he could not bring himself to part with it. He was engaged in this manner one Wednesday afternoon in his rooms, when he heard a slow, heavy step coming up the stairs, followed by a sharp rap at the door of his bedroom, which adjoined his sitting-room. He shouted to the stranger to come in, and an old gentleman entered presently by the door connecting the two rooms, in whom he recognised Mr. Lightowler's irascible neighbour. 
he stood there for a few moments without a word evidently overcome by anger which mark supposed was due to annoyance at having first blundered into the bedroom it's old humpage he thought what can he want with me the other found words at last beginning with a deadly politeness i see i am in the presence of the right person he began i have come to ask you a plain question here he took something from his coat-tail pocket and threw it on the table before mark it was a copy of illusion i am told you are in the best position to give me information on the subject will you kindly give me the name the real name of the author of this book i have reasons valid reasons for requiring it and he glared down at mark who had a sudden and disagreeable sensation as if his heart had just turned a somersault could this terrible old person have detected him and if so what would become of him instinct rather than reason kept him from betraying himself by words Th that's a rather extraordinary question sir he gasped faintly perhaps it is said the other but i've asked it and i want an answer if the author of the book said mark had wished his real name to be known i suppose he would have printed it have the goodness not to equivocate with me sir it's quite useless as you will understand when i tell you that i happen to know he repeated this with withering scorn i happen to know the name of the real author of this this precious production i had it let me tell you on very excellent authority who told you said mark and his voice seemed to him to come from downstairs had holroyd made a confidant of this angry old gentleman a gentleman whose relation i think you have the privilege to be sir come you see i know you mr mr cyril ernstone he sneered are you prepared to deny it mark drew a long sweet breath of relief what a fright he had had this old gentleman evidently supposed he had unearthed a great literary secret but why had it made him so angry certainly not he replied firm and composed again now i am mr cyril ernstone i'm very sorry if it annoys you it does annoy me sir i have a right to be annoyed and you know the reason well enough do you know said mark languidly i'm really afraid i don't then i'll tell you sir in this novel of yours you've put a character called wait a bit ah yes called blackshaw a retired country solicitor sir very likely said mark who had been getting rather rusty with illusion of late i'm a retired country solicitor sir you've made him a man of low character you show him up all through the book as perpetually mixing in petty squabbles sir on one occasion you actually allow him to get drunk now what do you mean by it good heavens said mark with a laugh you don't seriously mean to tell me you consider all this personal i do very seriously mean to tell you sir young gentleman said mr humpage showing his teeth with a kind of snarl there are people who will see personalities in a proposition of euclid said mark now completely himself again and rather amused by the scene i should think you must be one of them mr humpage will it comfort you will it comfort you if i let you know that i that this book was written months before i first had the pleasure of seeing you no sir not at all that only shows me more clearly what i knew already that there has been another hand at work here i see that uncle of yours behind your back here do you though said mark he's not considered literary as a general rule oh he's quite literary enough to be libellous just cast your eye over this copy your uncle sent this to me as a present the first work of his nephew i thought at first he was trying to be friendly again till i opened the book just look at it sir and the old man fumbled through the leaves with his trembling hands here's a passage where your solicitor is guilty of a bit of sharp practice underlined by your precious uncle and here he sets two parties by the ears underlined by your uncle in red ink sir and it's like that all through the book now what do you say what can i say said mark with a shrug 
you must really go and fight it out with my uncle if he is foolish enough to insult you that is not exactly a reason for coming here to roar at me you're as bad as he is every bit i had him up at sessions over that gander and he hasn't forgotten it you had a hand in that affair too i remember your victim sir was never quite the same bird again you'll be pleased to hear that never the same bird again very much to its credit i'm sure said mark but oblige me by not calling it my victim i don't suppose you'll believe me but the one offence is as imaginary as the other i don't believe you sir i consider that to recommend yourself to your highly respectable uncle you have deliberately set yourself to blacken my character which may bear comparison with your own let me tell you no words can do justice to such baseness as that i agree with you if i had done such a thing no words could but as i happen to be quite blameless of the least idea of hurting your feelings i'm beginning to be rather tired of this you see mr humpage i'm going sir i'm going i've nearly said my say you have not altered my opinion in the least i'm not blind and i saw your face change when you saw me you were afraid of me you know you were what reason but one could you have for that of course mark could have explained even this rather suspicious appearance but then he would not have improved matters very much and so like many better men he had to submit to be cruelly misunderstood when a word might have saved him although in this case silence was neither quixotic nor heroic i can only say again he replied in his haughtiest manner that when this book was written i had never seen you nor even heard of your existence if you don't believe me i can't help it you've got your own uncle and your own manner to thank for it if i don't believe you and i don't there are ways of juggling with words to make them cover anything and from all i know of you you are likely enough to be apt at that sort of thing i've come here to tell you what i think of you and i mean to do it before i go you've abused such talents as you've been gifted with sir gone out of your way to attack a man who never did you any harm you're a hired literary assassin that's my opinion of you i'm not going to take any legal proceeding against you i'm not such a fool if i was a younger man i might take the law in the shape of a stout horsewhip into my own hands as it is i leave you to go your own way unpunished by me only mark my words you'll come to no good there's a rough sort of justice in this world whatever may be said and a beginning like yours will bring its own reward some day sir you'll be found out for what you are that's what i came to say and he turned on his heel and marched downstairs leaving mark with a superstitious fear at his heart at his last words and some annoyance with holroyd for having exposed him to this and even with himself for turning craven at the first panic i must look up that infernal book again he thought holroyd may have libelled half london in it for all i know now it may be as well to state here that vincent holroyd was as guiltless as mark himself of any intention to portray mr humpage in the pages of illusion he had indeed heard of him from the langtons but the resemblances in the imaginary solicitor to dolly's godfather were few and trivial enough and like most of such half unconscious reminiscences required the aid of a malicious dullness to pass as anything more than mere coincidences but the next day while mark was thinking apprehensively of illusion as a perfect mine of personalities the heavy steps were heard again in the passage and up the staircase he sighed wearily thinking that perhaps the outraged mr humpage had remembered something more offensive and had called again to give him the benefit of it however this time the visitor was mr solomon lightowler who stood in the doorway with what he meant to be a reassuring smile on his face though owing to a certain want of flexibility in his uncle's features mark misunderstood it oh it's you is it he said bitterly come in uncle come in you undertook when i saw you last never to speak to me again but i don't mind if you don't i had a thorough good blackguarding yesterday from your friend humpage so i've got my hand in will you curse me sitting down or standing the other one stood no no it ain't that my boy i don't want to use hard words i've come to say let bygones be bygones mark my boy i'm proud of you 
"'What, of a literary man? "'My dear uncle, you can't be well, "'or you've lost your money.' "'I'm much as usual, thank ye. "'And I haven't lost any money that I know of, "'and—' "'And I mean it, Mark. "'I've read your book.' "'I know you have. "'So has Humpage,' said Mark. "'Uncle Solomon chuckled. "'You made some smart hits at Humpage,' he said. "'When I first saw there was a country solicitor in the book, "'I said to myself, "'That's going to be Umpage. "'And you had him fine, I will say that. "'I never thought to be so pleased with you.' "'You need not have shown your pleasure "'by sending him a marked copy.' "'I was afraid he wouldn't see it if I didn't,' "'explained Mr. Lightowler, "'and I owed him one over that gander "'which he summonsed me for "'and got his summons dismissed for his trouble. "'But I've not forgotten it. "'Perhaps it was going rather far to mark the places, "'but there I couldn't help it.' "'Well, I suppose you know that amounts to libel,' said Mark, "'either from too hazy a recollection of the law on the subject of publication, "'or the desire to give his uncle a lesson.' "'Libel? Why, I never wrote anything, only underlined a passage here and there. "'You don't call that libeling. "'A judge might. And anyway, uncle, it's deuced unpleasant for me. "'He was here, abusing me all the afternoon, "'when I never had any idea of putting the hot-headed old idiot into a book.' "'It's too bad. It really is. "'Umpage won't law me. He's had enough of that. "'Don't you be afraid, and don't show yourself poor-spirited. "'You've done me a good turn by showing up Umpage as what I believe him to be. "'What's the good of pretending you never meant it to me? "'You don't know how pleased you've made me. "'It's made a great difference in your prospects, young man, I can tell you.' "'So you told me at the cock,' said Mark. "'I don't mean that way this time.' "'I dare say I spoke rather hasty then. "'I didn't know what sort of literary line you were going to take up with, "'but if you go on as you've begun, you're all right. "'And when I have a nephew that makes people talk about him "'and shows up them that make themselves unpleasant as neighbours, "'why, what I says, make the most of him. "'And that brings me to what I've come about. "'How are you off in the matter of money, eh?' Mark was already beginning to feel rather anxious about his expenses. His uncle's cheque was, by this time, nearly exhausted. His salary at St. Peter's was not high, and, as he had already sent in his resignation, that source of income would dry up very shortly. He had the money paid him for illusion, but that, of course, he could not use. He had not sunk low enough for that, though he had no clear ideas what to do with it. He would receive handsome sums for his next two novels, but that would not be for some time, and meanwhile his expenses had increased with his new life to a degree that surprised himself, for Mark was not a young man of provident habits. So he gave his uncle to understand that, though he expected to be paid some heavy sums in a few months, his purse was somewhat light at present. "'Why didn't you come to me?' cried his uncle. "'You might have known I shouldn't have stinted you. "'You never found me near with you, "'and now you're getting a big literary pot "'and going about among the knobs as I see your name with. "'Why, you must keep up the position you've made, "'and you shall, too. "'You're quite right to drop the schoolmastering "'since you make more money with your scribbling. "'Your time's valuable now. "'Set to and scribble away while you're the fashion.' "'Make your A while the sun shines, my boy. "'I'll see you through it. "'I want you to do me credit. "'I want everyone to know that you're not like some of these poor devils, "'but have got a rich old uncle at your back. "'You let em know that, will you?' "'And quite in the manner of the traditional stage uncle, "'he produced his cheque-book and wrote a cheque for a handsome sum, "'intimating that that would be Mark's quarterly allowance "'while he continued to do him credit.' and until he should be independent of it. Mark was almost too astounded for thanks at first, by such very unexpected liberality, and something, too, in the old man's coarse satisfaction jarred on him and made him ashamed of himself, but he contrived to express his gratitude at last. "'It's all right,' said Uncle Solomon. "'I don't grudge it you. You just go on as you've begun.' "'I hope that doesn't mean making more hits at Humpage,' thought Mark. "'You thought you could do without me, but you see, you can't. "'And look here, make a friend of me after this, do you hear? "'Don't do anything without my advice. 
I'm a bit older than you are, and perhaps I can give you a wrinkle or two, even about literary matters, though you mayn't think it. You needn't have been afraid your uncle would cast you off, Mark, so long as you're doing well. As I told your mother the other day, there's nothing narrow-minded about me, and if you feel you've a call to write, why, I don't think the worse of you for it. I'm not that kind of man. And after many more speeches of this kind, in the course of which he fully persuaded himself, and very nearly his nephew, that his views had been of this broad nature from the beginning, and were entirely uninfluenced by events, he left Mark to think over this new turn of fortune's wheel, by which he had provoked a bitter foe, and regained a powerful protector, without deserving one more than the other. He thought lightly enough of the first interview now, it was cheaply bought at the price of the other, and, after all, he said to himself, what man has no enemies? But only those whose past is quite stainless, or quite stained, can afford to hold their enemies in calm indifference, and although Mark never knew how old Mr. Hunpidge's enmity was destined to affect him, it was not without influence on his fortunes. End of chapter 17chapter 18 of the giant's robe by f anstey this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 18 a dinner party mrs langton did not forget mark and before many days had gone by since his call he received an invitation to dine at kensington park gardens on a certain saturday to which he counted the days like a schoolboy the hour came at last and he found himself in the pretty drawing-room once more there were people there already a stout judge and his pretty daughter a meek but eminent conveyancer with a gorgeous wife and a distinguished professor with a bland subtle smile a gentle voice and a dangerous eye other guests came in afterwards but mark hardly saw them he talked a little to mrs langton and mrs langton talked considerably to him during the first few minutes after his entrance but his thoughts kept wandering like his eyes to Mabel, as she moved from group to group in her character of supplementary hostess, for Mrs. Langton's health did not allow her to exert herself on these occasions. Mabel was looking very lovely that evening, in some soft light dress of pale rose, with a trail of pure white buds and flowers at her shoulder. Mark watched her as she went about, now listening with pretty submission to the gorgeous woman in the ruby velvet and the diamond star who was laying down some little new law of her own, now demurely acknowledging the old judge's semi-paternal compliments, audaciously rallying the learned professor, or laughing brightly at something a spoony-looking fair-haired youth was saying to her. Somehow she seemed to Mark to be further removed than ever from him. He was nothing to her amongst all these people. She had not even noticed him yet. He began to be jealous of the judge, and the professor too, and absolutely to hate the spoony youth. But she came to him at last. Perhaps she had seen him from the first, and felt his dark eyes following her, with that pathetic look they had whenever things were not going perfectly well with him. She came now, and was pleased to be gracious to him for a few minutes, till dinner was announced. Mark heard it with a pang now they would be separated of course he would be given to the ruby woman or that tall keen-faced girl with the pince-nez he would be lucky if he got two minutes conversation with mabel in the drawing-room later on but he waited for instructions resignedly didn't papa tell you she said you are to take me in if you will if he would he felt a thrill as her light fingers rested on his arm he could scarcely believe his own good fortune even when he found himself seated next to her as the general rustle subsided and might accept the delightful certainty that she would be there by his side for the next two hours at least he forgot to consult his menu he had no very distinct idea of what he ate or drank or what was going on around him at least as long as mabel talked to him they were just outside the radius of the big centre lamp and that and the talk around them produced a sort of semi-privacy the spoony young man was at mabel's right hand to be sure 
but he had been sent in with the keen-faced young lady who came from girton where it was well known that the marks she had gained in one of the great triposes under the old order would but for her sex have placed her very high indeed in the class list somebody had told the young man of this and as he was from cambridge too but had never been placed anywhere except in one or two walking races at fenner's it had dampened him too much for conversation just yet have you been down to chigbourne lately mabel asked mark suddenly and her smile and manner showed him that she remembered their first meeting he took this opportunity of disclaiming all share in the treatment of the unfortunate gander and was assured that it was quite unnecessary to do so i wish your uncle mr humpage thought with you he said ruefully but he has quite made up his mind that i am a villain of the deepest dye and then encouraged to confide in her he told the story of the old gentleman's furious entry and accusation mabel looked rather grave how could he get such an idea into his head she said i'm afraid my uncle had something to do with that said mark and explained mr lightowler's conduct it's very silly of both of them she said and then to drag you into the quarrel too you know old mr humpage is not really my uncle only one of those relations that sound like a prize puzzle when you try to make them out dolly always calls him uncle antony he's her godfather but i wish you hadn't offended him mr ashburn i do really i've heard he can be a very bitter enemy he has been a very good friend to papa i believe he gave him almost the very first brief he ever had and he's kind to all of us but it's dangerous to offend him perhaps you will meet him here some day she added and then we may be able to make him see how mistaken he has been how kind of you to care about it said he and his eyes spoke his gratitude for the frank interest she had taken in his fortunes of course i care said mabel looking down as she spoke i can't bear to see any one i like and respect as i do poor uncle antony persist in misjudging anybody like that mark had hoped more from the beginning of this speech than the conclusion quite bore out but it was delightful to hear her talking something more than society nothings to him however that was ended for the present by the sudden eruption of the spoony young man into the conversation he had come out very shattered from a desperate intellectual conflict with the young lady from girton to whom he had ventured on a remark which as he made it had seemed to him likely to turn out brilliant you know he had announced solemnly opinions may differ but in these things i must say i don't think the exceptions always the rule eh don't you find that and his neighbour replied that she thought he had hit upon a profound philosophical truth and then spoilt it by laughing after which the young man thinking internally it sounded all right wonder if it was such bosh as she seems to think had fled to mabel for sanctuary and plunged into an account of his university disasters i should have floored my general all right you know he said only i went in for too much poetry poetry echoed mabel with a slight involuntary accent of surprise rhymes you know not regular poetry but mr pidgeley i don't quite see why can't you floor generals with rhymes which are not regular poetry are they so particular in the army it isn't an army exam it's at cambridge and the rhymes are all the chief tips done into poetry like paley rhymes why you know paley rhymes give you for instance all the miracles or all the parables right off in about four lines of gibberish and you learn the gibberish and then you're all right i got through my little go that way but i couldn't the general fact is my coach gave me too many rhymes and couldn't you recollect the the tips without rhymes couldn't remember with em he said i could have corked down the verses all right enough but the beggars won't take them i forgot what they were all about so i had to show up blank papers and i'd stayed up all one long too working asked mabel with some sympathy well and cricketing he said ingenuously i call it a swindle he talks quite a dialect of his own thought mabel surprised vincent didn't 
I wonder if Mr. Ashburn can. Mr. Ashburn, after a short period of enforced silence spent in uncharitable feelings respecting fair-haired Mr. Pidgeley, had been suddenly attacked by the lady on his left, a plump lady with queer comic inflections in her voice, the least touch of brogue, and a reputation for daring originality. "'I suppose now,' she began, "'you've read the new book they're talking so much about, this illusion. And what's your private opinion? I wonder if I'll find a man with the courage to agree with me, for I said when I'd come to the last page. Well, they may say what they like, but I never read such weary rubbish in all my life, and I never did.' Mark laughed. He could not help it but it was a laugh of real enjoyment without the slightest trace of pique or wounded vanity in it i make a confession he said i do think myself that the book has been luckier than it deserves only as the the man who wrote it is a a very old friend of mine you see i mustn't join in abusing it mabel heard this and liked mark the better for it i suppose he couldn't do anything else very well without making a scene she thought but he did it very nicely i hope that woman will find out who he is though it will be a lesson to her here mabel was not quite fair perhaps for the lady had a right to her opinion and anything is better than humbug but she was very needlessly pitying mark for having to listen to such unpalatable candour little dreaming how welcome it was to him or how grateful he felt to his critic when mark was free again after an animated discussion with his candid neighbour in which each had amused the other and both were on the way to becoming intimate he found the spoony youth finishing the description of a new figure he had seen in a cotillon you all sit down on chairs don't you know he was saying and then the rest come through doors and mabel said with a spice of malice for she was being excessively bored that that must be very pretty and original mr langton was chatting ponderously at his end of the table and mrs langton was being interested at hers by an account the judge's lady was giving of a protege of hers an imbecile who made his living by calling neighbours who had to be up early perhaps it's prejudice said mrs langton but i do not think i should like to be called by an idiot he might turn into a maniac some day they do quite suddenly at times don't they she added appealing to the professor and that wouldn't be nice you know if he did what would you do she inquired generally shouldn't get up said the rising young barrister i should under the bed and scream said the lively young lady he had taken down and so for some minutes that end of the table applied itself zealously to solving the difficult problem of the proper course to take on being called early by a raving maniac meanwhile mabel had succeeded in dropping poor mr pidgeley and resuming conversation with mark this time on ordinary topics pictures books theatres and people especially people he talked well and the sympathy between them increased then as the dessert was being taken round dolly and colin came in i've had ices mabel said the latter confidentially in her ear as he passed her chair on his way to his mother but dolly stole quietly in and sat down by her father's side without a word do you notice any difference in my sister dolly mabel asked mark with a little anxious line on her forehead she is not looking at all well said mark following the direction of her glance there certainly was a change in dolly she had lost all her usual animation and sat there silent and constrained leaving the delicacies with which her father had loaded her plate untouched and starting nervously whenever he spoke to her when good-natured mr pidgeley displayed his one accomplishment of fashioning a galloping pig out of orange peel for her amusement she seemed almost touched by his offering instead of slightly offended as the natural dolly would have been i don't think she is ill said mabel though i was uneasy about that at first fräulein and i fancy she must be worrying herself about something and we can't get her to say what it is and i don't like to tease her very likely she is afraid of being laughed at if she tells anybody but i do so wish i could find out 
children can make themselves so terribly wretched over mere trifles sometimes but the hour of bereavement as m de maurier calls it had come gloves were being drawn on the signal was given mr pidgeley after first carefully barricading the path on his side of the table with his chair opened the door and the men left to themselves dropped their hypocritical mask of resigned regret as the handle turned on mrs langton's train and settled down with something very like relief mark of course could not share this though it is to be feared that even he found some consolation in his cigarette the sound of mabel's voice had not ceased to ring in his ears when her father took him by the arm and led him up to be introduced to the professor who was standing before a picture the man of science seemed at first a little astonished at having an ordinary young man presented to him in this way but when his host explained that mark was the author of the book of which the professor had been speaking so highly his manner changed and he overwhelmed him with his courtly compliments while the other guests gathered gradually nearer envying the fortunate object of so marked a distinction but the object himself was horribly uncomfortable for it appeared that the professor in reading illusion had been greatly struck by the brilliant simile drawn from some recent scientific discoveries with which he had had some connection and had even discovered in some passages what he pronounced to be the gem of a striking theory that had already suggested itself to his own brain and he was consequently very anxious to find out exactly what was in mark's mind when he wrote before mark knew where he was he found himself let in for a scientific discussion with one of the leading authorities on the subject while nearly every one was listening with interest for his explanation his forehead grew damp and cold with the horror of the situation he almost lost his head for he knew very little about science thanks however to his recent industry he kept some recollection of the passages in question and without any clear idea of what he was going to say plunged desperately into a long and complicated explanation he talked the wildest nonsense but with such confidence that every one in the room but the professor was impressed mark had the mortification of seeing as the great man heard him out with a quiet dry smile and a look in his grey eyes which he did not at all like that he was found out but the professor only said at the end well that's very interesting mr ashburn very interesting indeed you have given me a really considerable insight into your uh mental process and for the rest of the evening he talked to his host as he drove home with his wife that night however his disappointment found vent never been so taken in in my life he remarked i did think from his book that the young ernstone and i would have something in common but i tried him but got nothing out of him but rubbish probably got the whole thing up out of some british association speech and forgotten it i hate your shallow fellows and upon my word i felt strongly inclined to show him up only i didn't care to annoy langton i'm glad you didn't dear said his wife i don't think dinner parties are good places to show people up in and really mr ernstone or ashburn whatever his name is struck me as being so very charming perhaps you expected too much from him hm i shall know better another time he said but the incident even as it was left mark with an uncomfortable feeling that his evening had somehow been spoilt particularly as he did not succeed in getting any further conversation with mabel in the drawing-room afterwards to make him forget the unpleasantness vincent holroyd's work was still proving itself in some measure an avenger of his wrongs End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of the giant's robe by f anstey this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nineteen dolly's deliverance about a week after the dinner recorded in the last chapter mark repaired to the house in kensington park gardens to call as in duty bound though as he had not been able to find out on what afternoon he would be sure of finding mrs langton at home he was obliged to leave this to chance he was admitted however not by the stately champion but by colin who had seen him from the window and hastened to intercept him 
"'Mabel's at home somewhere,' he said. "'But will you come in and speak to Dolly first? "'She's crying awfully about something, and she won't tell me what. "'Perhaps she'd tell you. "'And do come, sir, please. "'It's no fun when she's like that, and she's always doing it now.' for colin had an unlimited belief founded as he thought on experience in the persuasive powers of his former master mark had his doubts as to the strict propriety of acceding to this request at all events until it had been sanctioned by some higher authority than colin but then he remembered mabel's anxiety on the night of the dinner if he could only set this child's mind at ease would that not excuse any breach of conventionality would it not win a word of gratitude from her sister he could surely take a little risk and trouble for such a reward as that and so with his usual easy confidence he accepted a task which was to cost him dear enough you better leave me to manage this young man he said at the door run off to your sister mabel and explain things tell her where i am and why you know and he went into the library alone dolly was crouching there in an armchair worn out by sobbing and the weight of a terror she dared not speak of which had broken her down at last mark who was good-natured enough in his careless way was touched by the utter abandonment of her grief for the first time he began to think it must be something graver than a mere childish trouble and apart from all personal motives longed sincerely to do something if he could to restore dolly to her old childish self he forgot everything but that and the unselfish sympathy he felt gave him a tact and gentleness with which few who knew him best would have credited him gradually for at first she would say nothing and turned away in lonely hopelessness he got her to confess that she was very unhappy that she had done something which she must never never tell to anybody then she started up with a flushed face and implored him to go away and leave her don't make me tell you she begged piteously oh i know you mean to be kind i do like you now only i can't tell you really please please go away i'm so afraid of telling you but why said mark i'm not very good myself dolly you need not be afraid of me it isn't that said dolly with a shudder but he said if i told any one they would have to send me to prison who dared to tell you a wicked lie like that said mark indignantly all the manhood in him roused by the stupid cruelty of it it wasn't colin was it dolly no not colin it was harold harold caffin oh mr ashburn she said with a sudden gleam of hope wasn't it true he said papa was a lawyer and would have to help the law to punish me the infernal scoundrel muttered mark to himself but he saw that he was getting to the bottom of the mystery at last so he told you that did he he continued did he say it to tease you dolly i don't know he often used to tease but never like that before so i did do it only i never meant it now listen to me dolly said mark if all you are afraid of is being sent to prison you needn't think any more about it you can trust me can't you you know i wouldn't deceive you well i tell you that you can't have done anything that you would be sent to prison for that's all nonsense do you understand harold caffin said that to frighten you no one in the world would ever dream of sending you to prison whatever you'd done are you satisfied now rather to mark's embarrassment she threw her arms round his neck in a fit of half hysterical joy and relief tell me again she cried you're sure it's true they can't send me to prison oh i don't care now i am so glad you came so glad i will tell you all about it now i want to but some instinct kept mark from hearing this confession he had overcome the main difficulty the rest was better left in more delicate hands than his he thought so he said never mind about telling me dolly i'm sure it wasn't anything very bad but suppose you go and find mabel and tell her then you'll be quite happy again will you come too asked dolly whose heart was now completely won 
so mark and she went hand in hand to the little boudoir at the back of the house where they had had their first talk about fairies and found mabel in her favourite chair by the window she looked round with a sudden increase of colour as she saw mark i mustn't stay he said after shaking hands i ought not to have come at all i'm afraid but i've brought a young lady who has a most tremendous secret to confess which she's been making herself and you too unhappy about all this time she has come to find out if it's really anything so very awful after all and he left them together it was hard to go away after seeing so little of mabel but it was a sacrifice she was capable of appreciating end of chapter 19